Welcome to our friends from the Battle of Homestead Foundation and from the USW. Welcome to my fellow Pitt staff members and to our faculty and grad student colleagues. And thanks to everyone else who joined us here in solidarity tonight. I'm really thrilled to see so many members of our volunteer union organizing committees here because <laughs> Wednesday was Valentine's Day, a day to celebrate love. The labor of love that is union organizing deserves to be celebrated too. We love Pitt enough to want to make it better. And the protections and the benefits that come with being union members, we love that for us. And not just for ourselves, but for all of our coworkers, even the ones who don't quite yet understand the strength and power and satisfaction that being union members might bring. That's love. Amen. <laughs> Our labor of love has also produced remarkable friendships. This evening came into being because a number of us on the, the staff union organizing campaign started hanging out together, socializing and really getting to know each other. And we discovered that in addition to our mutual passion for union organizing, we also had shared connections with and history with the Battle of Homestead Foundation. That was the spark that it took to ignite Molly Ritter. <laughs> if you've met her, you know that she is full of energy, drive, and determination. Seemingly within minutes of this coming up in conversation, she had scored us an invitation to breakfast with the Battle of Homestead Foundation. Not difficult. <laughs> <laughs> You're all invited. At that meeting, we told our stories. And we were instantly enveloped in their support and collective wisdom. Our stories may feel new to us, but really the themes and the issues are as old as the hills and the steel mills of Pittsburgh. This evening came about because we knew we had a lot to learn from our friends at the Battle of Homestead Foundation. We want to feel more connected to our local labor history and we want to realize our place in the labor movement. We have some amazing speakers lined up tonight, and we encourage you at the end of their presentations to ask them all of your amazing questions. For our Pitt staff colleagues especially, we hope that you leave here tonight feeling energized and motivated to get out the vote and bring our union home. Pittsburgh is a union town, and I was going to say that we need to cement our place in local labor history, but we're going to be steel workers, so we need to smelt and forge <laughs> and shape and weld our place in local labor history. And with that, I will introduce Molly Ritter, who can introduce our first two speakers. So. Hi, everybody. It's really great to see so many labor enthusiasts in the room. Um, I was not supposed to be up here. It was going to be one of our colleagues, Kate, but she couldn't be here. So it's my distinct honor to introduce our first presenters, Dr. Jackie Cavalier and Dr. Charlie McAllister. And I am not off book, so you're going to all forgive me that I'm reading off of this paper. <laughs> so Dr. Cavalier is a history professor at CCAC, specializing in women's history and labor history. And any of my friends in the room know that those are two of my favorite topics. So as soon as Charlie told me about her, I was like, yes, she's going to be here. Um, we needed her to speak at this event for that reason. <laughs> Jackie is an award-winning educator, a seasoned union leader, the 2018 recipient of the Pennsylvania Labor History Society's Mother Jones Award. Pretty bragworthy right there. The author of two books, 
and she leads the Battle of Homestead's Archives and Special Collections Committee. We are so grateful and privileged that she is speaking with us today. Dr. McAllister seems to have done a little bit of everything in his <laughs> career. He's a longtime activist, having marched for civil rights and the anti-war movement, a world traveler, a published author, and has served various unions in various capacities over the year. Before retiring, Charlie was a professor of industrial labor relations at IUP and director of the Pennsylvania Center for the Study of Labor Relations. I don't know about anybody else, but I've been surprised at how many different centers and societies for labor there are in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's also one of the founders of the Battle of Homestead Foundation, which you will hear more about after the presentations from John, um, which is how I met him. He has been an invaluable mentor and champion for me and the other Pitt staff organizers as we work towards winning our union, and we're super excited to hear what he has to share with us tonight. So join me in giving Jackie and Charlie a very warm welcome. Well, I don't know how we're going to follow that, Charlie. <laughs> I like, know. Oh, that, that opening yeah. and the, yeah. I mean, it really is about love and solidarity, I mean, and about defending the common good and what unites us, and boy, do we need that in this day and age. I, uh, I'm always honored to present with uh, uh, someone who is a very dear friend, colleague, but more than anything, a mentor. Um, so it's always a treat for me to get to present with Charlie. Um, and we have some level of experience in doing this in tandem. Yes. So Ta you're gonna tag team in, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. at the union halls, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, I know my colleagues, uh, my friends, uh, brothers and sisters from the Battle of Homestead Foundation have heard this story many, many times. Um, but I'd like to start my introduction by saying that my father was a true blue union man. He worked in a factory for 45 years. And as a child, um, every dinner, every breakfast, every lunch, every time we were sitting at a table, my father always reminded us that it was the union that put that meal on the table. When we'd go off to school, it was the union that was allowing us to go to Catholic school because he was paying for it because of those wages. It was the union that provided us this and it was the union that provided us that. So it was instilled in me in a very, very, very young age what it meant to be in a union. So, of course, um, at CCAC, we are a unionized faculty, and we successfully unionized our adjunct faculty just about four years ago. Uh, we completed that process four or five years ago. Uh, I currently serve as the grievance vice president for the local um, 2067 AFT for CCAC. So in addition to having <laughs> a great deal of love and passion for labor history. Um, I'm out there in the trenches uh, fighting that good fight every day. So Charlie, of course, um, uh, has that extensive insight um, in terms of some of these events. I don't think you were around for some of these 1800 <laughs> events, but... <laughs> I feel it. I believe it. I feel it. <laughs> but, um, so we wanted to share, and what we decided to do was really highlight um, four particular areas um, that are turning points in labor history in the region. Um, and we're going to just give a little bit of background information for all of them, um, or each of them, I should say. But I do want to emphasize, as both Jen and Molly alluded to, you know, Pittsburgh really is the cradle of the labor movement. Um, so much has happened here. Uh, whether we're talking about conflict, whether we're talking about uh, victories, whether we're talking about, you know, action um, in every sense of the word. I mean, how many of you, of course, here, the AFL-CIO, the AFL-CIO? Well, both the AFL and the CIO, if you look November uh, 1881, um, the American Federation of Labor and Turner Hall, the convention was held um, for the establishment, the organization. And the same thing with the CIO here. Um, November 14th, 1938, the first convention of, uh, of the Congress of Industrial Organizations. So 
this is very important with respect to um, you know the history and these individual events that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight. So Charlie and I poured over. Of course, he is the author of the Point of Pittsburgh, which is a fabulous uh, work on labor history and Pittsburgh history more specifically. Um, and we came up with four events um, that we'd like to highlight for you tonight and talk a little bit about the historical context and uh, the consequences of these events. Because I feel very strongly as a historian that, you know, when we think about the who, what, where, when, and why, the why is this important to us um, is of utmost importance. You know, what were the consequences? What did we learn from it? And how does it help to inform us in terms of how we're going to move forward um, in this fight. So uh, we have 1815, the cord waners um, trial, the textile strikes for a 10 hour day, the cotton mill workers, 1845 to 1848. Of course, uh, the Homestead lockout uh, and the Battle of Homestead, which is of course the very um, uh, foundation on which our organization is, is built. Um, and then 1919, the Great Steel Strike, and uh, a little bit about some significant labor, um, uh, notable labor figures, um, Mar uh, Mother Jones and Fanny Sellens, that are certainly worth um, knowing. So you might ask yourself, what is a cord waner? <laughs> um, and a cord waner is different than a cobbler, and Charlie's going to elaborate on this. A, a cobbler typically fixes men's shoes. A cord waner makes new shoes out of new leather, out of leather. So um, that image, of course, of the cord waner there is, you know, uh, very um, medieval because <laughs> it is a medieval occupation right. indeed. But as Charlie explains here momentarily why this event is significant and why what happened with the cord waners in 1815 is important in understanding as you are moving forward in this organizing campaign, I really want to set the stage for the 19th century, uh, particularly in this region, because you have, of course, the, the, the beginnings of industrialization really taking shape in America. Um, we are briefly interrupted by the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865. Uh, but the wheels of industry are still turning during the American Civil War, um, for sure, in a big way. But in the early 1800s, if we think about labor and we think about work, one's labor, there is, of course, the overwhelming sentiment that one owns their labor. One owns their labor. I'm lending it to you for production. I'm lending my skill. I'm sharing my skill and talent with you. You don't own my labor. I own my labor, OK? And so if you look at these images and think about, I mean, just look at this image. There's a tremendous amount of pride in one's craft, in what they're doing, in what they're making, in what they've done with their hands. Okay. So as the unionization or these united fronts form, throughout the 19th century, and we have an evolution of them, right, throughout the 19th century. As these united fronts form, they are looking at things like the eight-hour workday. They're looking at wages. They're looking at safety. They're looking at all of those challenges that industrialization is going to present to them, okay? So when we think about the cord waner, this is, of course, a, a bronze that's in London. Charlie, what's the deal? <laughs> well, the, the, the critical thing, I think, and this is really at the heart of the matter of what unionism is all about, is that 
the court winner strike in Pittsburgh. There was one in Philadelphia before, but as is typical of Philadelphia, it was violent, not <laughs> not, not 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 nonviolent like uh, the Pittsburgh one, which is why the Pittsburgh one is much more clean philosophically because it really posed the issue about where do your rights come from, and and how do you how do you exercise them, and the, the critical. Uh, issue was English law, property rights, the owner owns the property, owns the tools, maybe has a store that sells the goods <coughs> that you're making. Ownership is one type of right. The other type of right is freedom, liberty, self-autonomy, skill, my ability to work and to make something useful. And these things were in conflict. English common law afforded a great deal of power to property. But the American Revolution had been about concerted activity to raise people's rights and liberties. And so there was a deep philosophical conflict here. When the Cordwainers got together, a couple dozen, making shoes was real important in 1814 in Pittsburgh because we were at the headwaters of the Ohio and we're shipping all kinds of hand tools, useful things, horseshoes, all kinds of metal things were already being made there, but all kinds of all kinds of leather goods and all kinds of things that are useful for people who are going to travel across the country and settle into the great Ohio, Mississippi uh, basin. So and critical to all of it is I can attest to it. It's always say that uh, the hit hitchhiking that I did a lot of, uh, having a good guidebook and having good shoes were absolutely critical. And when I was in Africa wearing a Palestinian kafir, which I crossed the Sahara and North Africa hitchhiking with, I didn't do it intentionally to get rides, but it really did help. Uh, but it, I did it because it was the most useful thing you could have to keep the dust from your throat and the and protection from the sun. Uh, making useful things, the power of that, and the cordwainers who made shoes for people going west, one of the things that they most resented was the fact that they were being told by the, the bosses uh, to cut these people. We're not going to see these people anymore anyway. So, you know, don't put the double layer of uh, leather on the bottom. Uh, don't bother to do X, Y, or Z. Part of it was craft pride. They had, they had a craft and a traditions of making shoes. I sat one time in Italy, and I had about $40 to get back to Belgium, and it was port worst flood in, in Italian history, 1967. And I sat, and I, my shoes, I was just, had holes in them, and I sat and I watched a cobbler. And he made me shoes from scratch in a, about a day and a half. I watched him cut the whole thing, sew it. He was a, he was a, uh, a true craftsman. Made it, for, and that those shoes lasted me for years and years. And I kept putting new uh, soles on it. Craftsmanship, the knowledge of the hand, is so incredibly important, and the solidarity of the people who make it and who have pride in doing it. So what, what the issue was, was the cord winners went on strike. And the, uh, they were arrested for withholding their labor from the boss. They, to go on strike, really, the root of it is, is that when sailors no longer wanted to transport or felt that they were being oppressed by either the captain or the, the mates or the company, they would strike the sails. They would take the sails down, wrap them up, and the ship could move without uh, uh, having sails. So the strike really is collective action on the ship to uh, affect the balance of power. And so when the cord wainers struck, they were taken, they were imprisoned, they were, they were arrested for a conspiracy in restraint of trade, which was the English model. Uh, conspirato, to breathe together, to breathe together, to talk together, and particularly concerted activity. That's the heart of the matter, is to breathe together, to talk together, come to some resolution, decide 
that you want to make things better in the workplace and then you act together to bring it about. Well, they were, they were brought to trial and the judge eventually ruled that you're not a slave worker, you can quit. But if two or more of you quit at the same time, that's a conspiracy in restraint of trade and it's illegal. And they were arrested and had to pay a fine. And that's the, really the, the heart of the matter. The people who argued concerted activity was all right were the Jeffersonians who said, hey, we just had a war. We had concerted activity to get away from England. And now you're imposing English property law on our free labor. And they said, yeah, that's, that's what it is, the protection, <laughs> the, the protection of property and the control that property gives. So the Cordwainer strike is very, very important from a philosophical point of view. And I remember it was right here at Pitt. I went into the, one of the libraries at the law school and looked up at labor law, number one volume, opened it up, Pittsburgh's Cordwainer's trial. I said, all right. And I read it and said, wow, this is it. This is the heart of the matter. This is what it's all about. Do we, are you, a, as an individual, you can quit. You're not a slave. But if you get together and talk about changing the workplace, having a right to shape your job, and often for the betterment of the employer, for God's sake. I mean, but a lot of employers, they don't care about that. They want control. They want domination. And we really face in this country a crisis of control and domination and people who want to do that to us long term. And we really need unity. We need uh, coming together. We need concerted activity. So I really so much appreciated the whole thing about love because solidarity really is about respect, certainly, most important, but also about love for your fellow human beings who are struggling to make a living and have a decent life. So that's, that's the heart of the matter. The Cordwainers were there. They stood up. They ended up being arrested and crushed. And <coughs> quick, quick story before the end, just when President Obama came to Pittsburgh to speak at the AFL-CIO convention, I got a call. They said, please, give us a one-page description of Pittsburgh labor relations uh, that Obama can give for a speech. But I did. I sent it in. I got a frantic call from Washington. They said, my God, there are four defeats and only one victory. <laughs> I said, yeah, but every one of those defeats advanced the cause of labor. They, they, they pushed the, they pushed the, uh, the envelope and, and got respect. I mean, the, the, the railroad strike, the bloodiest event in Pittsburgh, they say, ended up cutting wage, cutting, increasing wages and cutting hours just because of the violence and the ferocity of that struggle. Other owners stopped. They were going from 12-hour to 14, 15-hour days. That eruption led, there's a claim that that eruption led to a general uh, backing off uh, of the number of hours and an increase of wages, even though it was crushed by the power of the state. So the struggle is where it's at, and it, the raising, and we have, things are a lot better today. We've got a real chance. We can win this here. Yeah. And uh, that's really important that you do that. You can make Pitt a better place, not only for you, but for the students, for the administration. I've had an ongoing quarrel, which I'm not going to talk about <laughs> with the Pitt administration, but I have never met a, uh, a, a labor relations thing. When you try to write them, it's do not reply. And I wrote them, I said, it's so great to have such honesty uh, because I never did get a reply. I wrote them five or six times, raising different issues with what they were doing to me. I never got a reply. I said, now that is, at least it's true, at least you're honest. You feel our pain. <laughs> I feel your pain. Uh, potential candidates may have difficulty answering this question. The Civil War was fought over slavery. <laughs> <laughs> The Civil War from 1861 to 1865 was fought over slavery. And at the heart, of course, of that conflict was cotton. 
And it's important to understand that the cotton that was produced in the American South, of course, was going to England, but it was also going to New England. It was going north. Okay? And it was fueling the textile mills. And in the first half of the 19th century, very early on, a guy by the name of Lowell, the namesake of Lowell, Massachusetts, he went and he looked at models in England of textile production. And he brought those ideas back to New England, to Massachusetts, and he employed them there. He implemented them there. And the major source of labor in those textile mills in the Lowell mills of New England were young women. And this worked very well for that particular production for a variety of reasons. First of all, at that particular point in time, on the earliest stages of industrialization, if you think about New England and the far-reaching areas of the countryside, for example, I mean, what opportunities do you have if you're a young woman, really? I mean, certainly you're going to be married off, if possible, at a very young age. Um, you really don't have access to occupation. You don't have access to education at the same level as men do at that particular point in time. And so what Lowell was based on was this recruiting strategy where, of course, they would go into the countryside and say, hey, look, you know, uh, I see that you have a 13-year-old daughter, a 15-year-old daughter, and a 16-year-old daughter. And these daughters are financial liabilities, aren't they? They're just more mouths to feed, right? But we're going to bring them to the city, to Lowell. We'll bring them to the urban center. And they will live in a dormitory-style environment. We'll ensure in this very, of course, Puritan type of world, we'll ensure they go to church on Sunday. They will perform household chores every morning they'll go to work a portion of that money will go home to you to your family and they'll be taken care of but of course they're going to work all day right and so initially you know this plan looks really great on paper for young women also you know thinking about that limited mobility, it's, it's an adventure. It's an opportunity to go to the urban center and work and be independent where you wouldn't have had that opportunity before or otherwise. So young women fueled the textile industries. And we often put a tremendous amount of focus on the low experiment and what's happening in New England without really understanding, of course, that we had cotton mills here in Pittsburgh, and particularly on the north side. So the cotton mill strikes uh, led by women in the 1840s in Pittsburgh are extremely significant because this is where women are, you know, ready to, of course, uh, stand up, protest, strike, and it's predominantly, of course, over working hours, the number of hours that they're spending. And remember, we don't have any eight-hour workday law. There's nothing like factory safety. There's no workman's compensation. There's no health care. You know, there's no health insurance. There's nothing like that. No regulation at all. Okay, very little limited intervention, if at all. Okay, so taking this on and, of course, you know, uh, leading these strikes over work days, as you can see, protesting 12 hour work days, you know, in hopes of getting the 10 hour, they're not even asking for an eight hour work day, right? I mean, it's a 10 hour work day. But it came with a, a, a loophole. And so the strike was successful 
but of course it came with a loophole. Charlie, you want to explain the loophole? Sure. <laughs> the, yeah, the, uh, when, when the, the, the strike in 1845 led to legislative change uh, that, uh, that the tenant, that the, uh, no women could work in the mills more than 10 hours. Uh, and what they did, and to get around that in 1848, they passed, they had a loophole in there that you, while that was the law, individual workers could sign away their rights. In other words, Yellow Dog Contract is what that is named. But they could, they could sign it. If you freely gave up your 10-hour rights under the law, they could work you for 12. Uh, also, children... They were as young as eight and nine were working in the cotton mills of Allegheny City, and they, uh, the women, had struck in '45 for uh, to restrict child labor to no lower than 12 years old. So there were a lot of young kids because they had small fingers, and there was great, everybody said how great it was to have this child labor was so important to the. Uh, cotton. The main reason why we had so much cotton is that we were shipping everything downstream was heavy, metal and equipment of all sorts. We need something light to bring back up and to build an uh, industry that would, all these boats that went downriver could carry uh, cotton upriver and created, they mostly made work clothes, heavy, you know, Carhartt type stuff uh, for working class people. That was Pittsburgh's uh, uh, textile mill. The thing about the women striking was that they were, when they got charged in the courts, the issue was that, um, uh, anyway, that, that the question was about what is a woman's nature uh, became the, the issue. Women should be, if they want to be treated with the respect due a woman, uh, then they have to act like a woman. And the cotton mill strikers did not act like women in the traditional model at all. They rioted. They broke into the factory. They pulled people off the machines who were in there uh, scabbing them. And be around them, the men would, didn't, their men did not intervene, but they protected them from the police. Well, they broke into the cotton mills and kicked the, the workers out. So the, the, the issue, what, 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 if, what is a female, what are their rights, what is their character, was at the center of it. And also, this is the beginning of, of a very common tactic of dividing workers. This is the time of the potato famine. The workers in the original factories were mostly uh, English, Welsh, uh, and now you had influx of Irish who are used as strike breakers in, especially in 1848. You be, have the beginnings in Pittsburgh of the Know Nothing Party. The Know Nothing Party is an anti-immigrant party who elects a mayor from jail. Um, the a mayor uh, ran as the, for ma mayor when he was imprisoned because of actions he had taken against Mercy Hospital, which was a Catholic place. And of course, the Know Nothings hated the Catholics and hated the Irish. But the, 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 what you see and what's important, I think, the thing to say about the cotton mill was this one of the first uses of ethnic divisions and r later racial divisions will become central. Imperialism, class control is built on divide and conquer. That's the central reality. So there, when people who are running things are always looking for ways to pit people against each other and to use any issue that they can find that divides them because that allows them to rule. So that's really one of the central things. That and we are going to talk a little bit more about child labor. I mean, because certainly, I mean, child labor is uh, commonplace throughout the United States and very, you know, specific to Pittsburgh as well. Um, uh, children are used in coal mines, you know, young boys can fit in areas that uh, uh, grown men can't. 
and as Charlie mentioned, especially young girls, for finishing work, um, you know, those small hands are really advantageous in um, textile production. And, you know, this is something that we really need to be cognizant of as union members, as activists, as organizers today. We're talking about child labor in the past tense as if it doesn't exist anymore. And I can assure you, it certainly does. Um, so, and there's, you know, state after state in the United States right now that are looking to loosen up those child labor laws. So even though we look at it, you know, in a, in a historical context, um, it's certainly, you know, something that organized labor needs to be very cognizant of and aware of today. So that takes us to 1892, um, a topic that's very near and dear, of course, to our hearts for a variety of reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, we think about uh, this region and the importance of steel uh, throughout the United States, you know, I mean, throughout the United States, of course, but very specific to, to, to Pittsburgh. I mean, if you think about the World Wars, you know, World War II could not have been fought without uh, the production that was coming out of this region, um, rooted in steel, of course. Um, Carnegie is synonymous with steel, you know. But one of the Although things... Although he never got his hands dirty. Oh, true, <laughs> yeah, right, you know. Carnegie, Carnegie has this Horatio Alger, you know, kind of myth, mythical you know, story attached to him. Uh, that whole rags to riches, you know, Scottish immigrant, um, and so on. You know, Carnegie was a telegraph operator for the Pennsylvania Railroad. And uh, certainly, you know, there was an understanding that there was a significant <laughs> difference between manufacturing, steel, manufacturing rails for the railroad out of iron versus steel, all right? Steel was much more durable. It didn't wear as, as often. It didn't need to be replaced as often, but it was much more expensive to produce. So Carnegie, you know, his little nest side that he puts aside, he goes and he invests in a process otherwise known as the Bessemer process, the Bessemer converter, which in essence, um, I'm not going to go into the science of it because I know I'm, I'll be incorrect. But in essence, it blows the carbon out of the molten metal at a quicker rate, ultimately allowing for the continuous casting process to take place. So um, Carnegie really was instrumental in creating what becomes a very common practice in business and corporations at that time. Something known as vertical integration. So if there's anyone who's business oriented, business you know, uh, degrees in here, of course, vertical integration. That meant that he was able ultimately to control every aspect of production from raw materials to finished product and the transport of those finished product, Carnegie was able to control all of that, okay? And he did so by going in, for example, this is Henry Clay Frick, another name that should sound familiar. And what Carnegie did was, hey, look, I want to control Connellsville Coal and Coke. I was born and raised in Connellsville. And uh, I was always enamored and, and just would find it so funny whenever my mother, we would be, you know, all the, all the um, people would be sitting around the table, all our relatives and the old, old uh, uh, my grandfather, my mother, my aunts and uncles and everyone. And they'd say, do you remember when old Chubb Dad lived in the, in the beehive Coke oven? And I was like, he lived, oh yeah. He was a drunkard, and, grand, and your, your great-grandmother threw him out, and he went and he lived in the Beehive Coke ovens. I mean, you know, it, they were brick. It was warm. He could live there, right? Um, so that region, of course, is, is, was a hub uh, of, of, of coal and, and coke, and Frick Coal and Coke, Connoisseur Coal and Com Coke Company, was owned by Henry Clay Frick. So Carnegie says, look, I'm going to make you my right-hand man, right? I want... 
the Coal and Co. Company. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Edgar Thompson Works? Right? Who's Edgar Thompson? Right. <laughs> President of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Yay. Right? I mean, that mill was his namesake because of an agreement that Carnegie forged with him to transport uh, that steel on the Pennsylvania Railroad. So there was a tremendous amount of integration there, a tremendous amount of control, um, which allowed Carnegie ultimately to become, you know, the richest man in the world. Uh, um, after the turn of the 20th century. Um, when we think about how we view Carnegie, the lens in which we view him through today, it's a love-hate relationship. If you think about <coughs> the long-term benefits of that fortune, and for any of you who know your Pittsburgh history, of course, Carnegie had a dilemma, a problem, after J.P. Morgan offered to buy him, buy his mills, because in the 1880s, Carnegie had written a work called The Gospel of Wealth, and in The Gospel of Wealth, he said, the man who dies rich, when I ask students this question, they always say, I say, the man who dies rich dies and students always say, happy. Right? <laughs> Carnegie wrote, the man who dies rich dies disgraced. So after that transaction, he has $380 million to get rid of before he dies. And that's when a million was worth a million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when we think of the Carnegie Foundation and we think of the Carnegie Museums and we think of Carnegie Hall and we think of all of these things that of course we can benefit from today, we also have to understand at what cost that legacy was built. On the backs of those workers, a tremendously large immigrant population who were working 12, 16 hours a day, 24 hour turns in the mill, they weren't using a library. Okay? So, the situation at Homestead, and I implore you all, I beg you, if you go to the waterfront and you go perhaps to the, the movie theater there and you drive down and you see those smokestacks. Think about, you know, you're on hallowed ground, right? I mean, the vastness of what becomes homestead, the homestead works, is just really hard for us to put our heads around. I mean, and we know where the workers lived, and we know where the supervisors lived, and of course, we know that Carnegie and Frick both outgrow their homes and end up moving to New York. There, if you've ever been to Clayton, Frick outgrew it. So, one of the things that, and I know Charlie's going to clarify this here in a moment, you know, one of the things that is often a point of confusion, as we often refer to this as the homestead strike. <laughs> when, when in fact it was a lockout. So, Charlie? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, they were going to have a strike and would have had a strike anyway. And but they were before strikes happen. Oftentimes people get r rambunctious, and they were getting real rambunctious in uh, 1892, uh, late June, and they were like hanging effigies of Henry Clay Frick from the yard arm of the uh, mill, and uh, they were, not a lot of work was getting done. So they, <laughs> they locked them out, but they locked them out because there wasn't anything happening in there anyway, and they knew the strike was coming on July 1st. Just to back up a little bit though about what is astonishing to me is that, you know, it, be, before this incredible explosion of productivity. The only thing, I mean, today we're looking at a, a, a change in work life. 
artificial intelligence, all of these incredibly r radical changes. This is a ver time very much like 1892. You, when the Civil War, it is astonishing to me that all those guns and battles and sh uh, cannonballs and shrapnel and all that equipment was made by teams of men making a hundred pound ball of iron at a time. It was craft skill, a team of people, usually the same ethnic group, often the same family, working under a union contract from Maine to Texas, not a wheel turned or a fire burned without an amalgamated man, as it was the, the, uh, they wrote at the time at the Homestead Strike. Iron making was a union thing. They controlled who was hired. They were paid by the amount of metal they put on the ground. So you put more metal, you get more money, then the union divided it up. It was a, really a lot of autonomy, power, and control in the hands of working people. And the Civil War was fought with people making metal that way. Then you have this enormous change with the Bessemers, with the open hearths, where now with an open hearth, 300, 300 tons at a time can be made, not 100 pounds at a time. This is just a gigantic leap. But what really makes it extraordinarily interesting, interesting why Homestead is so important is that Homestead got a union contract in 1889. And for those three years, it was the Workers' Republic. Homestead was a relatively new town. They controlled seven out of eight of the council seats, and the mayor was Honest John McLucky, who was a mid-level uh, steel worker, but a brilliant orator and a very kindly and interesting human being. The union ran the town. The union had enormous power at the sh on the shop floor. When Frick, Frick hated this, what Frick despised was that every time they were going to put in a new machine, there was a bunch of busybodies from the amalgamated, the union, asking him what he's going to do. Who's going to work here? Who's going to hire those people? Uh, don't you think maybe the thing if it was oriented this way would be better than what you're, the way you're doing it? Absolutely infuriated Frick. We have the money. We have the control. You have no right to any say in this whole process. That was the attitude that the management uh, had at Homestead. And uh, so when it came to the, 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 sh the shootout, when it came to the attempt to retake the mill, uh, and after, when the lockout comes, the 300 armed men come down, they l try to land without success. They're held for about uh, eight hours uh, in the boats, can't get off, can't get out, and they ultimately surrender. The women and children beat them up as they, they have to run a gauntlet. Uh, and this really shocks America. This is, la this is capital and labor in a very dramatic, and it's estimated more than 10,000 people watched it. You can sit on the hills of Swissvale and Rankin, and it's a, it's a natural amphitheater. And so it was, a, not only that, but it was international press was there from London, from France. There was every, all over the United States, front page story, this battle, this archetypal battle between labor and capital. And when the union was crushed and the ability of, to bring in replacements, et cetera, broke, broke the strike after about four or five months, um, it was a dramatic, incredible change that happened. Under the union contract, people worked, eh, some worked 10 hours a day, some worked seven, some worked, they worked according to the job they were doing. If they were working on a particular piece of equipment, whatever that did, that's the, the hours that worked. Almost nobody worked 12, though some did for the, around the furnaces, but not seven days a week. They had Sundays off. They had, uh, and they, then is the pre-electrification, so they didn't work in the evenings, too much. They kept the furnaces going and some of the processes going. But once the, once the union is broken, they go to the 12-hour shifts, seven-day-a-week, 84-hour weeks.
for everybody under a certain level. About 60% of the mill worked 84 hours a week and the worst of all, this was invented somewhat later as electrification came in, they did swing shift so that you worked one week 84 hours and then the next week you had to work on the night turn 84 hours. And so every other Sunday you had a day off and every other Sunday you worked 24. And obviously the people would take naps during uh, uh, open hearth, takes seven, eight, ten hours uh, uh, to do it. So in between there would be a few hours where you could nod off, etc. But it was a brutal existence. And it also led to the total control of the town. The union was broken, independent uh, po political life was broken, and a total corporate dictatorship. And so employment at will, there would always been a certain level of employment at will to somebody fire somebody, but this became the doctrine of American labor relations. Unlike anywhere in Europe or Japan, they, their workers have a certain right to at least fairness to get fired. You can't just be fired for any reason or no reason, which is the American rule. If you're not a, in a protected class because of race or gender or harassment of some sort like that, you have a limited amount of protect, very limited amount of protection. But if you're just a worker, you have no intrinsic right to a job. You can be fired for good reason, bad reason, or no reason. And that's, the, uh, the, that's why unions here have had to struggle so hard to survive and why they've been so incredibly important to give breathing room uh, for uh, working people. This is, uh, if you have the opportunity, um, uh, certainly if you use the bike trail down there, the pump house, um, that's where we conduct a lot of our programs uh, for the Battle of Homestead Foundation, but um, it's the last remaining building from the Homestead Works. Um, the Boast Building is uh, where a lot of the activity took place. It's now home to Rivers of Steel. Uh, right on uh, 8th Avenue in, in Homestead. The union headquarters was up on the top floor of that building. Sure. Yeah. So, I, I, by the turn of the 20th century, um, you know, obviously the place of the United States has changed dramatically. Uh, certainly with respect to our place on the international stage. Uh, if you think about the fact that we exceeded our continental boundaries, we've acquired territory beyond those continental boundaries, constructed an all-steel navy, which, you know, uh, allowed that to happen. Um, and in the early 20th century, <clears throat> certainly if we look at the period between 1860 and 1920, there is a tremendous influx of immigrants into the United States. Um, coming predominantly from Southern and Eastern Europe. So that second wave or new immigration as it's referred to, new immigration, um, in the second half of the 19th century through the early 20th century until we get immigration restriction, really strict immigration restriction by 1924. But there, those immigrants are coming predominantly from Southern and Eastern Europe, okay? Of course, Pittsburgh, you know, we have that legacy in terms of the ethnic enclaves. Um, you know, why do we have Polish Hill? I always ask students, why do we have pierogi races at the Pirate Games? <laughs> right? Where did the pierogies come from? But you have to remember, what are those immigrants bringing with them? They're bringing history, they're bringing language, they're bringing religion, they're bringing tradition, they're bringing ritual, they're bringing food, they're bringing drink. Okay, and the fear is, of course, that they're also bringing these alternative ideologies, you know, that's coming with them too. That's being transported across the ocean. So uh, there's, you know, for every action there is a reaction. That's just the way it is. For every action there is a reaction. And obviously there is a reaction uh, to immigration, particularly in the form of nativism and the first federal measure to regulate immigration comes in the 1880s in the form of the Chinese Exclusion Act um, which limited immigration on, uh, of Chinese 
into the United States for a period of 10 years. It's then extended for another 10 years, and then it gets, of course, a, a enveloped in the other immigration restrictions. Um, but uh, nativism really emphasizes what it means to be a purebred American. Okay, What does it mean to be a purebred American? And when we think about the mines and the mills in particular, of course, Every immigrant group is represented in those working environments. And they're usually associated with a particular job or put in this particular area because of their ethnicity. And Charlie's going to talk more about strike breaking and, of course, uh, being able to capitalize on that divide and conquer strategy or that divide and conquer, of course, mentality, particularly in terms of bringing black workers in as strike breakers or scabs. Understanding that one of the largest internal migrations in United States history is taking place by the turn of the 20th century of black workers, fleeing, black Americans fleeing the American South and making their way into industrial centers in the North in hopes of securing wage jobs, getting out of, you know, they're entrenched and debted in the, to the land and sharecropping and tenant farming. So they're making their way to northern industrial towns like Pittsburgh, like um, Chicago, like Detroit, um, and Cleveland, and so on. Okay? So uh, in looking at the very specifics of this event, again, I'm going to hand it over to Charlie here in a moment, I think that we also have to understand, of course, that with the changing place of the United States, that's really reinforced as a result of World War I, from 1914 to 1918, okay? So when we're looking at this 1919 event, obviously that's one year after the end of World War I. And it also coincides with 1917 being the Bolshevik revolution. And Reds, the Bolsheviks being the Reds, of course, um, and the fact that those labels, those associations, uh, radicals, socialists, communists, troublemakers, the list goes on. Many labor leaders are fixed those labels. Okay? Um, anarchists, right? Anarchists. So there's certainly some level of backlash, as we know and we'll see, as a result of what's taking place throughout the international system. Remember, you know, if you think about um, those associations and those labels, socialism and communism, what was Marx's rallying call? You know, we can, we can of course, pull apart the whole Communist Manifesto and think about it and talk about it forever. That's a whole other topic. But workers of the world do what? Unite. Workers of the world unite. So, of course, that, that philosophy um, becomes, of course, uh, part of the backlash towards organized labor in the United States, even though it was very important that workers were protected and had rights during the course of World War I because of the need for manufacturing at that particular point in time. Okay? The other thing I'd like to say before handing it off here is, you know, I think it's important, and one of the, the, the reasons I was so happy and grateful, I'm, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to be here with you all tonight, is I think we have to remind ourselves that people died to unionize. People died for the right to organize. You know, I think that in today's climate, oftentimes, you know, when we think about the struggle of those who came before us, I mean, having that right to organize was so important that people put their life on the lines in order to do so. 
And so as we look at individuals like Mother Jones and Fanny Sellens, Fanny Sellens was willing to die for the cause, and indeed she did. Mother Jones, Mother Jones <coughs> lost her husband and her four children, all under the age of, of six in 1867, as a result of the yellow fever epidemic. Four children under the age of six and her husband. And she took that grief and she transformed it into action. The most dangerous woman in America. I love her. They declared martial law one time they heard she was coming to Colorado. The governor declared martial law. <laughs> So, Charlie, you want to talk a little bit about the specific situ I mean, the, the specifics of the situation well, in, in I, 1919. I think 1919 really stands out in so many ways as uh, the most depressing of all of the, uh, the various uh, labor struggles and repressions that come about. First of all, civil liberties were suppressed uniformly. Uh, the steel mills, it was estimated uh, that in the Mon Valley, the, the company, the court, U.S. Steel court, controlled 25,000 armed men. They deputized all the, the uh, management uh, of the mills, all the professionals were given little tin uh, uh, stars as uh, deputies, and they were armed. And so the repression was incredible. The, the amount of people that die in 1919 is less because the other side has almost no weapons. It's a totally uh, overwhelming amount of power on the side of the corporation. And yet it's an incredible struggle that, that ensues. But the most vicious and cynical and terrible and long-lasting result of it is the importation of blacks massively sending empty boxcars through the south. The boll weevil is destroying the southern cotton crop from about 1915 to 1920. It's coming from the west to the east across the cotton fields. And so sharecropping, people are starving. And so the migrations which had started earlier of people fleeing the repression in the south now become a flood up to the north. And they're recruited directly in to bring them in as strike breakers into Pittsburgh in 1919. And there's a couple of amazing uh, novels, uh, one of them called Blood on the Forge, written by a black communist who, uh, from du about Duquesne. The, the ex just the incredible power it was. Here's a person who comes from the South who's been beaten, treated uh, constantly as a powerless person comes into, into Duquesne, given a star, declared a deputy, and given a gun. They use black, armed black um, in Duquesne as enforcers uh, over the hunkies, the Eastern Europeans. And this is a, hardly a great <coughs> recipe for long range race relations. Uh, and in Braddock uh, and in where I work, Swissville, that those, those resentments, now you're three generations away, but the anger and the hatreds remain and people don't even remember exactly why, but they're there. And it, the, the, I think we're overcoming them. We're you know, four generations, it usually does, that's about what it takes to overcome deep uh, divisions such as we saw in 1919. We're beginning, I think, to see that uh, we're electing black uh, leadership on many levels in this town and much of the working class has become very accepting of that, uh, at least in this area. But um, racial division becomes the, the, the card, the final uh, card to lay on the table when you want to break uh, uh, unions. And so the, the struggle of 1919 is still with us. and uh, I think we wanted we added one last thing about well, we have, yeah we have uh, you know, just, talk yeah, about just Mother, some yeah. images of Mother <laughs> Jones. Just you know, she led the Children's March, uh, the Mill um, Children, in 1903, um, starting in Philadelphia and making her way up to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's residence. Um, was passionate, a passionate advocate for the abolition of child labor and for the plight of 
women and children, particularly in coal mining towns. Um, uh, Mother Jones, my yeah. favorite, my favorite <laughs> quote story is, of course, you know, uh, women were not permitted um, to speak uh, in a, in, a, in a public forum. And so, uh, as you can see here, when the judge asked her who gave her a permit to speak publicly, she said, Patrick Henry, Henry Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. Okay. So, you know, Mother Jones, again, she, um, she didn't fear she was jailed. She, of course, uh, uh, would just show right back up again and have another, you know, another public gathering. I mean, she was unstoppable. But Mother Jones was... Uh, very much, very much impacted, of course, it, it, by the death of Talking Ellis. about the age issue, she was like 85 oh, when yeah. she was uh, during the 1919 strike. So sure. uh, she was a, and she was wonderful in terms of being able to synthesize the message in fighting terms. She, she didn't give long-winded speeches, but she knew how to get to the essence of the issue very, very quickly about the, the suppression, the violence, and the rights. We fought for democracy in Europe and here in the Mon Valley. We, we can't vote, we can't uh, move, we can't freely hang out together. The horse, horse, people on horseback riding up and down Homestead and Braddock and groups of over two people, they would be get clubbed just for being on the street during the 1919 steel strike. So it was heavy duty repression. And, and in the, the Coalfields, I mean, she, she has, you know, one rally where she, she just reams the workers. You know, what's the matter with you? Yeah, really. You know, this is how This is how we do it. If this had been West Virginia, we would yeah. have had a gang of us and we would have taken care of those people. Right, you gotta be willing to take up arms and do whatever is necessary, you know, to win those rights. But again, she was, of course, uh, um, very much impacted by the death of Fanny Sellens. Uh, the Fanny Sellens was known as the angel, the angel of the working class. Um, this is an image, uh, one of our members is a very accomplished, uh, fabulous artist, and she's done a number of renditions of Mother Jones, Fanny Sellens. Um, her work is, is, is really beautiful, as you can see here. This is Fanny Sellens in jail. Um, but one of the, of course, more compelling and unfortunate images of Fanny Sellens is this image. Um, uh, Fanny Sellens was, was murdered in Brackenridge. She was bludgeoned to death. She was shot. And it was hung in every steel uh, uh, local uh, during the 1919 strike. Her picture, that picture, was hung there to call attention, obviously, to the brutality of the rule that in the steel and the coal, the coal country. Uh, and but Fanny is that she, she went to Colliers, West Virginia, got arrested uh, helping the, the strikers there, and they put her in jail, and there was a nationwide attempt. The mine workers had people right from all over the country, an outcry to free, free this woman. And the, uh, the judge finally said, well, listen, if Fanny, if you just promise never to come back to Colliers, I'll let you out. And she said, as long as there are little children with their feet blue with the cold. As long as there are hungry babies, I'll crawl to get back to Collier's and I, you'll never keep me. I'm in a free American. I can go where I want and I will come back to Collier's uh, I, with if I the last breath of my body. And uh, that was Fanny Sellens and they killed her. And they got away with it. Unit, it was called justifiable homicide. She was killed by about a half a dozen thugs shot in the back, then her head was crushed. The rock where her head was crushed on was m recently moved from the hill where it happened in Natrona Heights down in front of the Union Hall uh, in Ambridge. Brackenridge. Uh, in Brackenridge. Ambridge in, uh, Brackenridge. Yeah, Brackenridge. Yeah. So, our message to you. <laughs> <laughs> we have one last thing to do. <laughs> All is not lost. <laughs> We have uh, a victory. We have a victory. <laughs> um, certainly, as we look at the interwar years and the onset of the, you know, the Great Depression takes hold, and 
Franklin D. Roosevelt is elected to the presidency in 1932. We don't inaugurate in January then. We inaugurate in March. So he's inaugurated in March of 1933. And, you know, as he is, um, you know, seeking the nomination, is, if you know your history, he makes reference to the New Deal. I have a New Deal for Americans. <laughs> Um, when he makes that reference, it's not, of course, as though the New Deal was this nice, neat package of programs, um, you know, with a ribbon tied around it, still being, you know, kind of worked out. But one of the things that um, Roosevelt did was he surrounded himself with, uh, you know, not career politicians necessarily, <coughs> even though, of course, some do become that, but, you know, he academics. I mean, he is... Uh, if you look at the New Deal programs, you know, the Civilian Conservation Corps is one of my favorite ones to talk about. Um, you know, the Civilian Conservation Corps is responsible for planting about two billion trees in America. You know, Roosevelt's critics are, what the hell does he have people out there planting trees for, right? Um, but the Dust Bowl and erosion of the soil, I mean, he's looking at, he's influenced by those who are looking at things very scientifically. Um, and systematically, which is really important when we think about the New Deal. He's also, of course, responsible for appointing the first female cabinet secretary, Frances Perkins, who is the Secretary of Labor. Frances Perkins, FDR's wife, Eleanor, they come out of the progressive spirit. They come out of social reform. Perkins in the garment industry and all of the organization attempts that are taking place there factory safety law, people like Crystal Eastman, uh, um, uh, factory safety and the law, you know, if you go to Market Square, you see that um, historical marker there, Crystal Eastman, who puts forth the death calendar to show how many deaths are taking place in industry. Um, 526 people killed in one year in Allegheny County in uh, industrial accident, 526. Yeah. And so, you know, these women are, are, are really coming out of that progressive spirit and are helping to inform the New Deal. So, of course, as we grow closer to World War II in the 1930s, um, uh, uh, manufacturing, <laughs> you know, production um, is, is, is going to be key. It's going to be necessary in terms of having an adequate workforce to ensure that happens and workers being able to enjoy those rights they've been after for quite some time um, through all of these other you know examples and situations that we've talked about throughout uh, the United States and very specific to Pittsburgh. So one of the acts that was part of the New Deal was the National Industrial Recovery Act. And the New Deal was two New Deals. The first New Deal is 1933 to 1935. And the second New Deal is 1935 to 1936. The most enduring legacy of the second New Deal was, of course, the Social Security Act of 1935. Um, but the National Industrial Recovery Act is ultimately, with the Agricultural Adjustment Act, struck down as unconstitutional. But one part of it survives, and that's the Wagner Act. And certainly the Wagner Act then, of course, is the foundation of the National Labor Relations Act, which will come to create the National Labor Relations Board, um, and provides us many, all of our protections that we enjoy as organized labor um, today. So just that right to organize into a union, the right to engage in collective bargaining, to sit down at a table across from your employer and negotiate at that table, okay, is embodied in, of course, the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. So that takes us to J&L and Aliquippa in 1937. And, you know, Charlie and I, of course, are, are, are really excited and honored to be joined tonight with <laughs> Bernie Hall. Um, Our best student. <laughs> Because Charlie and I uh, uh, worked with many other uh, representatives from labor 
and we created at CCAC a labor management certificate program there uh, several years ago. And Bernie was in the first cohort uh, to come through the labor management certificate program. Um, and so I know he will have something to say about Aliquippa. Um, but of course, this is where, uh, the, for the first time, the court will uphold the National Labor Relations um, Act. And, uh, you know, this reference, 10 men versus J&L Steel, um, is the formation of the Steelworkers Organizing Committee in Pittsburgh in 1936. Um, so you can see here, of course, ultimately, uh, that's what will become one of uh, uh, the world's largest unions, as indicated here in the historical marker. Um, and it's a tremendous victory. It is a win. Um, and ultimately, we get the formation of the United Steelworkers, your sponsoring organization, <laughs> right, your sponsoring union, um, as a result of that. Charlie, you have anything to add? Well, or I'll just add that the last thing I'll say is when I went to the, uh, the district director for Pennsylvania's office, it was really heartening to see two framed newspapers on the wall right that he looks at all the time. One is 1892, the front page for the Homestead strike, and the other is 1937 and the JNL decision of the Supreme Court. That was the, the shift in time that saved nine. Uh, there were uh, all the uh, progressive legislation of Rosa had been struck down by the Supreme Court, many of the most important. And when the Wagner Act came up before them, one justice shifted. And so it became a uh, one vote majority that it was uh, uh, constitutional to allow workers to organize. And I know we were talking right before this and maybe Bernie could say something about El Equipa and about the threat to the very laws we're talking about right now with the Supreme Court that we have and the potential for a, uh, a, a president who would be extremely hostile to organized labor. Uh, do you want to say a word and then? We'll shift, yeah, well, absolutely. We, we've, and then we're going to open it up to yeah, folks to t talk. So For sure. But a quick word about Al Equipa. <laughs> Charlie says a quick word. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's Charlie's quick. That Char yeah, Charlie's quick. Um, first, the taut hammer take us off. Uh, second, um, I always enjoy hearing their, their lectures. Um, very scholarly, well put together. Uh, when I talk, I am not. Uh, so uh, I'll, I just I apologize in advance. Uh, I'm very passionate about what I do. Oh, Wanda, I was looking to see if you or Tyler were here. I didn't see you sneak in. A little louder than yeah. that. Oh, sorry. Hi, Melinda. Hi. <laughs> first thing I have to say this. It, it, this always rubs me the wrong. Well, first of all, I can go in a million different directions. We're not far removed from this stuff, actually. In that case, I cannot remember the one gentleman's name. He was uh, an officer in the local union that was fired. Um, his granddaughter is married to the local union president of local 10-7-7-4 in Beaver County still, um, which is quite interesting. And uh, I had to inform him, hey, do you know who your wife's uh, grandfather was? How do you know him? Well, let me tell you. Uh, you would think that you would know that, but, but he didn't. Um, but to go back, I have to say, uh, I'll, I'll do respect to the presentation, Carnegie was full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it's amazing because U.S. still really kind of, it, it's, we could talk for hours of that culture. And it's funny because I was thinking about it as I'm coming up here, and there was a, couple, a few years ago, Jack would have said, now Bernie, can't say that, but I'm director now and you're retired. So. That's right. You know, when Carnegie says, you know, to die a rich man, it is to die in disgrace. Bullshit. You know, the way he lived his life, he died in disgrace. All right? People who go to work every day, they punch a time clock. You know, I remember going in the mill in the morning. It was so cold. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. i got to get up. I don't know. Chances are I'm going to get forced to double that day. Working in hellish conditions, but I did it. I had a young family. I had kids to take care of. I had to take care of myself, right? And I did it. And, you know, uh, I'm proud of that. 
I'm really proud of that. Uh, I wouldn't change what I what I did uh, for anything. And so many of our members have done that and kind of lived that story. And they get to a place in their life where they actually retire in comfort. Now, it's harder to do, right? But I think there's real dignity in that. And, you know, I'll be the first one. I'll be able to pass something on to my children. I, I'm not going to die in shame. You may die in shame, but I'm going to die. I'm going to be happy about it, right? Because I worked hard to get this. And when Carnegie says that, it just burns me up because, uh, you know, you got to give. And he put his name on all these things. Yeah. He did that so people would remember him. He could have easily said, you know what, I'm going to name this after one of the maimed workers or somebody we killed or the, 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 the kids that were left. He didn't do that. So it, it, it always bothers me when it's talked about. Um, Carnegie was full of shit, and if I ever write a book, that's the title. Um, <laughs> if you go back, Aliquip is an interesting place. Um, <coughs> growing up, I just remember hearing all these stories, and for such a small town, it has so much history. That tunnel is still there. Yeah. Very famous tunnel, the intersections here. There's another picture that goes along with this one. You'll see a tipped over mail truck. So what happened was, uh, you know, when all this was going on, um, this here is actually, I don't think this, this wasn't during after the, uh, this might've been taken after the decision come down. Well, before that, what they were doing is the company sneaking people, because these, these guys were fired, there's a big, Ha ha going over it. Workers are standing out, and the company's trying to get scabs to go in and run the plant. So, all these people milling around notice all these damn milk trucks coming through. And you'll see pictures of an overturned milk truck because they what they realized was the company was sneaking scabs in on milk trucks. So, what they did was started to overturn the milk truck, and you see people what they were doing beating the hell out of them uh, in the picture. But, um, there's so many really good pictures of this day and this event. Uh, there's a couple of after the announcement was done. If you're facing directly uh, opposite of where this picture is taken, you're going to look at downtown Aliquippa. There's a couple pictures. They're not as famous, but I think they should be shown more. There's literally thousands of people that come out on the street spontaneously to cheer that victory. Um, and all that's left there is, you know, there's a little blue marker. Uh, that commemorates it, but so many people drive past it, it had such repercussions on our country and the way that we live and everything that we do. Uh, what Charlie was alluding to, when this case was settled, it was a 5-4 decision. Um, it was bipartisan, but it was a 5-4 decision. And if anybody knows anything about recent times, they don't really care much about precedent these days, right? Um, and there's actually a case, I couldn't remember if it was Trader Joe's or or somebody has actually filed a case challenging the constitutionality of portions of the National Labor Relations Act and the board's um, uh, ability to enforce these laws. Uh, I just saw yesterday or the day before, Amazon has now joined that suit. I mean, they, they're, gonna, they're gonna spend tens of millions, hundreds of million dollars on this case. It's gonna be huge. And basically what they're saying, they, the original case hasn't challenged the constitutionality of the complete act. Oh, you can keep the act, but the board can't enforce it. So if we were to, if we were to break the law, if we were to violate the National Labor Relations Act, you can't go to the labor board and file a complaint and say, I was fired illegally and go through that process. You'll have to file a claim in federal court and they can demand a jury trial. And I know those of you uh, with Pitt, um, you know, any time that we've had to go, e even under the systems that we have, the Pennsylvania Labor Relations Board, it's very, very slow. Imagine if we had to go to a jury trial on all these things. Yeah. And sometimes some of those, those rights that are violated that the board protects, it may not be big in the grand scheme of things, but it's very important for you. And, you know, do you have the money to litigate a jury trial in front of the, you know, against the University of Pittsburgh or U.S. Steel or any, no. Basically, they're saying, hey, you can have your little law, you just can't force it. Um, but growing up in Aliquippa, uh, it's a special town. To this day, I'm sure many of you may be familiar with it. it when you go to Aliquippa, people will tell you, I was from Plan 6, Plan 11, Plan 12. The company literally built the town. Uh, there's a great story, and I'll just, just tell this one little anecdote, and I'll move on. But 
uh, you know, in, in the 1890s, Woodlawn and that, that whole area really was just, it, it, the French would trade with the Indians there. There was some shallow water, there was a back, there was a, a, a just kind of like a backwash up in a little logs town in Woodlawn. Uh, small community grew up. The railroad ends up coming through there. Very small community in the 1890s. Jane L is, is going gangbusters here in the city of Pittsburgh. They want to move up the river. They purchase the land. And from 1890, now you go fast forward to 1910, it's like the crown jewel of Western Pennsylvania. It's literally a company built town. And it was built in plans. And this is another thing, it's another Carnegie's full of shit type moment for me because even to this day when you talk to folks who were in management, they'll tell you it wasn't really segregated. The company didn't tell you where you had to live because all those plans you had you know, Eastern Europeans in one place, black workers in another place, Italians in another place. They're right, the company didn't tell you where you had to live, but what they told you is you can't live here, 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 here. <laughs> right? That's the same shit they do today. It's, it, the more things change, the more they really are the same. Uh, I grew up on what was Plan 7, Plan 6, uh, Highland Avenue. Um, actually, it was company housing. j and had built it. Uh, uh, my claim to fame is that was the poorest of all the neighborhoods. That's what, like, the janitors, like, the really, like, the lowest of low. There was African Americans, Italians, and, and the laborers. And to be a laborer in a mill back then was really menial work. Um, but ironically, the next couple streets up, no workers could go. That was all management. Until this day, if you go drive down Highland Avenue, you'll see they're all row houses, kind of built next to one another, cookie cutter. Those that are still standing, but if you drive up the hill up into Hopewell where the management houses are, you can see the architecture change. And like knowing that context, looking at it, it's like living that row history and you can picture it. And you know, back then things were a little more ornate when they built them. And some of those houses are nice and it's a very depressed area, I'll put a very depressed. But even to this day, Highland Avenue and those streets, all those houses, most of them are condemned. A lot of them are getting tore down. But those other houses, they were the nicer houses. So those are the ones that people have actually kept, maintained, put some money into. They still stand. And uh, it, it, again, it just goes to show that this, this kind of, these kind of things aren't that far removed. Um, if you ever get a chance to go down and see this marker, um, it's a pretty special place. The tunnel was still there. That tunnel, thousands of people went through in and out. That was the one way in and out to get into the J&L works. And I remember as a kid, it was seven miles, I think it was. It stretched literally seven miles down the river. Um, it was incredible. My uh, great grandfather worked there. My grandfather worked there. My mother and father worked there. Um, unfortunately, then the, the collapse of the steel industry it happened. My older brother tells a story <laughs> when he was born. Uh, he's much older than me and my, my, bro my twin brother. Um, they were fat and happy. I remember when we were young, we saw he had a pinball machine. My mother had a Camaro. And, but we grew up poor. I remember the electricity being shut off. And I, what the hell happened? It was the, really literally the collapse of the steel industry. Um, Right. And we, we live like at 20 minutes. Yeah, so okay, uh, I'm, I'm gonna wrap you, it up right now. Do you okay. want the introduction? That we play for you? <laughs> well, I wasn't sure how this was gonna go. I just wanted to say a little bit about Aliquippa. So I, I, I got him off on Aliquippa. That was uh, that it was, was the good. Carnegie thing that really screwed my <laughs> night up. So I'm sorry, Molly. No, go ahead. Um, I think at this point, just to we make sure that people can get out on time, mm. uh, go ahead and bring it home. Tell us how everything they were talking about leads us to now, the union But I, yes, I will done. say this. Um, a few years ago, when the grads ran their first campaign and lost, it was stunning loss, right? Uh, everyone thought that, that they had it. It was 34 vote difference. So really, it was a matter of flipping 17 people in a unit that size, it's nothing. Uh, and I remember we had a war room set up at the, at the building and people were just crying, people were crying and that. And of course we thought we were gonna win, so no one was really there to kind of do it. And I was the only staffer there and everyone's kind of looking at me, what the fuck am I gonna say? Excuse my language. <laughs> um, but actually it kind of went back to some of the things that we were talking in class. And uh, the, it took me back to the very first slide you showed. Every single thing he put on there, we got our asses kicked. 
Homestead was a massacre. <laughs> we got around. But that's what makes the labor movement special. Like nothing right. worth doing is easy, right? right? But everything like in labor, it's unique. It's built on these these big. And you, it would be easy to give up. I mean, after Homestead, it was what thirty years until yeah, until years. the unions finally took hold. And um, and I think coming full circle, it, it kind of goes back to what the grads went through when they started it. Because even as a union, it was kind of like. Yeah, this ain't never gonna happen. They're never gonna organize the University of Pittsburgh and that kind of holy shit, they're actually doing it. There was the loss and we thought, well, you know, the faculty were talking, but after that loss, people were gonna be kind of like discouraged. discouraged. And anyone who knows anything about our union, when, when, it, when you look at our organizing department, it's like you see tumbleweeds, but like, where is everybody, <laughs> right? It's a small but mighty army. But really, it was the workers that kind of self-organized. All, all of the organizing that's going on in university and really throughout the region, it's really been, it's the workers doing it. It's not any massive amounts of organizers. So once again, kind of out of that defeat, um, working people kind of stuck through it. And like, I think Allegheny County, just our union alone, the thousands and thousands and thousands of members um, once Pitt is done, uh, it's probably going to be close to 15,000 members who have organized just in Allegheny County in maybe an eight-year period. That's crazy. That, that our district alone will grow probably 25%. Um, and industrial unions, unions in general, when you're talking about growth and those kind of numbers, and that's organic growth, hasn't been seen in my lifetime. So. It really is something special, and I think it's just a testament to the labor movement out in doors, no matter what we're faced with. Bernie, can I add one thing too? I just, I just want to encourage you all, and and, and really, um, you know, we we are here to support you all in any way, in any way that we can. But I want you to think very, um, you know, diligently on the idea that organizing and, and winning that union is only the beginning. That's the easy part. That's the easy <laughs> part. I mean, that's, that certainly is something that we had, to, we had to encourage, you know, our adjuncts, which were very, you know, kind of, um, and I know this is not the adjunct campaign. I'm, I'm just using that as an example. But the win, oh yeah, we got a union, we won. No, the getting the union is the beginning. That's the beginning, it's not the end. So, um, you know, please keep that in mind that it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing fight um, once that union is formed and you need to protect it, um, you need to embrace it, and you need to keep it safe and, you know, keep it going and keep it moving forward every single day. And we know a lot of our examples here uh, were, of course, based in, you know, industrial unions and, and so on, but the principles remain the same. So, you know, we wish you the best of luck, and we're here as a resource, the Battle of Homestead Foundation. We pride ourselves on being a, a, an organization that not only works to preserve the, the history of that event in 1892, but we also uh, work to tell a people's history, um, uh, the social history of this region and uh, all of the, the, the people and the communities that make it what it, what it is. And so we're so happy that uh, you asked us to be here this evening and we appreciate it very much. And we're here for you as a resource. I just want to say that the unions will give you a way to have a voice, to have some leverage, to have some input, to have some dignity, to have some respect. And it's, it's a powerful thing to stand with people who, you're, they're your equals, but yet you join together and you have intelligent conversation with people who are entrenched in power and don't see things, because they're up there. Uh, and they're, they're separated. You can show them a better way because you folks know what the work is 
and how it should be done and you know the inadequacies of how it is being done and it's really up to you and you can make a, a much better place for you and for all the rest of everybody including the students who are incredibly important allies as you look down the road I think there it's central that you really need to be communicating with them and telling them what you're trying to do to help them so I did not get a chance to introduce Bernie um, <laughs> but I've been I, I was tasked with doing this and I was fangirling all day when I was thinking about it so I'm just that is something to... I have never heard <laughs> I hope that was recorded. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> um, so I just thought um, as we head toward the question phase, um, I would bring up a couple of points about Bernie that I think are really important. First of all, we're really envious that you had Charlie and Jackie as your teachers. That, <laughs> that is amazing. Um, but second of all, uh, Bernie was the USW District 10 organizing director for five years. So he knows all about the labor of love that is union organizing. So we appreciate that knowledge um, and that understanding that we get from you. Um, and in fact, he participated in a White House summit on union organizing, which I think is really important to mention for all of us organizers in the audience. Um, and then since his election, to be USW District 10 director in uh, 2021. He now oversees the USW's activities over all of Pennsylvania, representing over 50,000 active members in over 120 local unions, including our very own Pitt faculty. And I think it's safe to say that he cannot wait to add the staff and the graduate students Absolutely. to that list. So, right, so we are going to get you here, get you out of here in 12 minutes. But <laughs> in that time, if people have questions, now is your time to ask Jackie, Bernie, or Charlie any questions that came up while you were watching the presentation or listening to their speech. And if you don't have questions, that's shocking. <laughs> so just raise your hand. Anybody who thinks of anything. And if you don't, I do. Corinne. All right. I, I do operate on like, oh my god, in fear. What if this happens? <laughs> but nobody thought Roe versus Wade would get overturned. How likely is it and what can we do to not get the Supreme Court to be like, ah, it's just a rule. They can't enforce it. What is that about? And I'm a are we being recorded? <laughs> well, I just want to make sure if I'm being recorded, my answer will be a little different. Um, I, like, I, I view it this way, I, and you, you guys may have a different take on it, but um, I, I think sometimes we get fat and happy, right? And we take things for granted. Just like Roe versus Wade, everyone said, ah, oh, it's a wedge issue. They'll never do nothing. Well, yeah, they'll do something. Even now, as this Supreme Court case, or as this case is working its way through the courts, there's a reason they try to get it filed in Texas, right? They wanted a Texas federal court. Fortunately, it was moved to a California court, but it will end up probably in front of the Supreme Court. But at the end of the day, like, it all kind of, I don't know how to say this appropriately, but don't be they, 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 they should probably, I mean, they, they, it will be very difficult in the short run. It will, that and it can completely upend things. But I think they need to be careful what they wish for. Because when the Wagner Act was passed, you gotta remember before that, we were shooting at one another. We were firing cannons. We were, we were on sit down strikes. We, we had sympathy strikes. Um, you know, uh, because we, you were out on strike, everyone else on the campus went out on strike. A lot of that, those sorts of things were kind of put to bed and said, well, this is for labor peace, so we can have labor peace across the country. Well, if you want to blow it up, it goes both ways. Now, I'm not advocating for that uh, because really it would be chaos. It would be kind of cool, but it would be <laughs> chaos. Um, and I think that that's why they're trying to do it in a certain way where you can keep the act if you want it. We're just arguing the fact you can't enforce it. Um, but I, I don't know that that's going to cut the mustard. Um, 
unfortunately we live in a world like there's going to be a lot of things. I mean, it, this is going to go on. It, it wouldn't get in front of the court for at least another year or so, maybe two. Uh, we got a really important election coming up, and you know, just every day watching to you, I'm amazed. There's going to be a lot more things between now and then to really worry about that. But if it does happen, just as hard as it's going to make things, it opens up a whole other world of possibility for workers. That's right. And currently under the board, it's hard to organize under the vast majority of people want to join a union. But it, the way that the law is structured is very difficult. You remove the Wagner Act, everyone can join a union tomorrow. You don't need a majority. If only 50 of you want to be a union, you can be a union. Um, just like it was back in the day. And that worked pretty well uh, at, at times. So I think they, I don't think it's as dire as it sounds, but I think it would be a radical shift in labor relations in the country. And I think as it gets closer to the courts, there's gonna be a lot of people on the other side of the room are gonna say, well, you know what? That, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we might wanna rethink yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, a lot of this has to do with- uh, Turn around and speak. A lot of this has to do with a lot of uh, politicians complaining about the power of the executive branch. That the executive branch is doing too much, basically because Congress doesn't do anything. That's just an aside. But the executive branch, they're saying, that's where the La National Labor Relations Board goes to the executive branch. Right? So if the labor board is making all this stuff, then they're really acting in place of the president. And that's what they're arguing. That's not the president doing it. That's the people at the labor board doing it. But they're also doing it at the SEC. They're doing it all over the place at all of the cabinet positions. Whatever they do in terms of regulations, they're attacking that everywhere. I think there's three big ones coming up, and the board's one of them. They're kind of tying them together. It, it could be ugly, but be careful what you ask for. We've got time for probably one or two more questions. Anybody else? Uh, one of the slides mentioned the uh, about the textile strike mentioned it as a lost industry and uh, that loss being blamed on organizing and I'd, I'd like you all to elaborate on that um, yeah, specifically so what, what do you mean by the lost industry and what do you mean by organizing taking the blame well the, after the, the textile industry in Pittsburgh of course with the Civil War the lack of the cotton coming ease of the cotton uh, trade was virtually shut down internationally because of the Civil War and uh, of course the textile mills on the north side died but they like to blame it on labor uh, on the militant women and all the uproars and the, the cotton mill riots but it was it was objective shifts in the reality of the uh, political and economic situation much more than but this, it's very typical that Labor gets blamed for, you know, an awful lot of things that are really being caused by all kinds of global and other uh, shifts and economic realities that's, that that are really causing it. But of course, the people who are in charge are always looking for somebody to blame for things that go wrong. And that was the first first industry that they blamed the workers on was the cotton mill strike. But but it really, I think, had much more to do with the, sh the shift in. Uh, the economics of the 1850s and 60s. Yeah, it's always, I mean, they, they, you know, industrialization in the United States was changing, and so that division between North and South and who was doing what and how it was being done changed very much after the American Civil War. So, um, you know, the industry was waning uh, anyway, but it, as Charlie indicated, it is the typical blame that industry went over because, you know, the workers were unionized and they wanted too much money. I mean, uh, that's usually the way the blame is placed, unfortunately. So that was an excellent question because, um, you know, I think it, it, it just reinforces the shift that's actually happening in the United States at that time. Go ahead. Um, this is a question. What is, as a labor historian, what is the uh, kind of perspective on the North American Free Trade Agreement in relation to kind of the labor movement in general. I guess if that's too broad a question, I apologize. Did well, everybody hear that? Okay. About NAFTA and the free trade. I mean, 
free, free trade is, is terrible in general for the United States. I think we gave up all of our basic production in the name of free trade because people could make enormous amounts of money by having cheaper labor in other countries and being the middlemen. So the coasts, I remember when the collapse was happening here, I was invited to speak in, um, in Boston uh, at a big event. And I talked about the disaster that was happening. They were booming because the coasts were doing absolutely fine with the new import import uh, uh, that were coming in. It was all the, the coasts were thriving. The center of the country was dying, and uh, so I think some people make it out of, well out of a global situation where you can drive down the wages. But we have suffered terribly by the loss. Look at supply chain issues. Look. At, Walk in and look at tools. We used to make beautiful <coughs> tools, the best, some of the nicest machine tools and hand tools in the world. It's all, they have American names, but they're all made in China. We've lost all of those skills that were, are central to it. And all the stuff we wear, virtually everything that human beings really, what we still make are weaponry and things connected to fossil fuel exploitation and use. Automobiles, bulldozers, whatever. Those are the things that we make that are connected right around the fossil fuel and military concerns. Human stuff that we need to live, we don't make it anymore. It comes from somewhere else. And we really, I really believe in fair trade and that we should go to a universal system not that once any, any commodity, you cease, you no longer make 50% of it, you're allowed to protect. Not only are you allowed, you must protect it because the centralization of everything in China is terrible for the environment, for the, the transportation. It's terrible for China. And we really need to redistribute productive activity and balance it. it it's much better to have a society that has all has agriculture, has, has uh, people who make things, build things. But those are important to mix in with knowing things and. Uh, People told us here, you don't have to, we don't need backs, backs and hands anymore. We're going to be the brains that are going to run everything. <coughs> I, I don't think so. We, we, to have a balanced society, to balance human beings, we need both physical and mental uh, sides. And this country desperately needs to, re, to have small farms to come back. Bring in those immigrants. Here the people are dying to get in here. I want a whole bunch of Mexican people and our truck farms around our cities to feed us with fresh things that don't aren't shipped about 3,000 miles to, or more uh, to just have food. We need we need Ukrainian mechanics. We got the whole down in McKees Rocks, other places. We've got every church, every type of a, a ethnic club you could possibly want. We just don't have any people anymore. Bring them in. Let them open the doors. We need. We're never going to rebuild manufacturing without immigration. We need people who are hungry and want to physically work hard. I mean, that's just the way it is. And uh, we need that balance. And to, to say we're only going to bring in intellectuals and, and, uh, and compete with you guys to drive your wages down, that's what they want to do. The corporate people want to, they want more tech people and stuff, bring the creme de la creme from other countries and then drive the wages down of all the people, we, all our kids who we told had to get college degrees and get masters and PhDs, et cetera. All of my kids are struggling with these issues. My grandchildren, I, I've had a great run, but who I really care about are those my grandkids. And where, what kind of world are they going to have? Artificial intelligence, constant surveillance, incredible robotics, et cetera, et cetera, on the potential for domination and control Carnegie and Frick be salivating to have <laughs> the possibilities. And we see what's happening in China with an incredibly productive and hardworking and disciplined workforces, yet we see the incredible uh, level of control that can be exerted by a centralized thing. And we're all heading for it. And we need, we need to rise up and come from below and say, no, we want people to be able to have a, a decent life. We want to be able to talk to each other and not, we want real, we want living human intelligence, not artificial intelligence. <laughs> that's right. that's my, I'm an old guy. You know. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, we're gonna wrap this up so that we can all go eat some food and chit chat. Um, and so I have one more question, and this question is stemming from my own struggle as somebody who did not grow up in a union family. My dad, my brothers, nobody that I knew was part of a union. And when I figured it out, when I figured out that there was such a thing as unions, I was just beside myself with glee. Uh, and then I found that it was actually really difficult to learn about it. And I was seeking this information and I was looking for different ways to educate myself on this incredible power that we have in each other. <coughs> and so for any beginners in this room to the labor movement or who know that they need a union in their workplace but they're not really sure how to start, where would you recommend that they start? Books, podcasts, movies, documentaries, how do we educate ourselves when we can't just whip this together and have you come teach us? Jackie, that sounds like well, I mean, I, I always encourage, well, first of all, uh, you know, we have a wonderful historical society that is the Pennsylvania Labor History Society um, that has a wonderful and very extensive bibliography available with a plethora of resources um, uh, that course are you know focused on, on the history of labor in, in, in Pennsylvania organized labor in Pennsylvania I think that um, obviously Charlie has a wonderful book the point of Pittsburgh um, that uh, really chronicles the history of, of, of Pittsburgh with a, 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 a narrow focus on on work and workers you know not just organized labor but on work and workers because not all workers are organized, even though we'd like them to be. But I think, too, we have to understand that, um, you know, your, your point, Molly, is, is, is an important one because it's, it, it's not coincidental that this history is kept from you. Right. <laughs> okay? I mean, it's yep. not coincidental. Um, the lack of including <coughs> labor history in United States history curriculums, the exclusion of these types of events, um, uh, denial of, you know, what prompted different situations. So <coughs> it's really important that as you, of course, are exposed or learn more about the history of labor in America and organized labor in particular, that you're able to share it with one another and share it with others. Um, and, you know, I mean, we could definitely yeah. pull together and we would be glad <coughs> to do so, um, you know, kind of a, 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 a nice list of resources that you all could use and distribute and... We would love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Also, it sounds like you're book. talking about consciousness raising, right. which I also love. Can I piggyback on that, though? Uh, you're right. I mean, you, you said. I, I like Thanks, to be the Bernie. contrary. No, it wasn't right about Well, I, I don't, I don't want to come off as saying I disagree with you, because I agree with everything you said, but I, I, I'm just also uh, very pragmatic about it. I think also it's understanding, like, what's the, what is a union? Right. And too often we let other people define that for us. Like, you don't have to pay dues to United Steelworkers to be a, a union. You don't need a piece of paper signed by the government saying, hey, we recognize you as a union. <laughs> you don't need the University of Pittsburgh to say, okay, you have a union now. Like, what you guys are doing now, you're a union. Like, what you've done is collective action, even putting this on. And even a lot of members, even people in leadership in labor unions, I think we all kind of live in our bubble when we get sucked into those definitions. Like, who are you to tell me what I should view a union as? This is ours, <laughs> like, those workers. This is what we do. Um, so I think, for me, I think that's the most important thing for understand. Don't don't be, don't don't get held back by these uh, arbitrary and just kind of made up definitions and rules and box <coughs> because that's someone else's definition. At the end of the day, when you are organizing, you're all organizing for a reason and that purpose. And everything that you should do and all your thoughts and actions should be around that purpose. It doesn't have to fit someone else's box. I mean, there are a lot of people in this country that under the law can't, under the law, can't form a union, but they're a union. 
they advocate like a union, they work like a union, and, and they get, these folks in some of these pictures before the Wagner Act, <laughs> no, there was no piece of paper that said you're a union, and Carnegie and Frick swore for years, there's no union here, there was a union. Uh, so that for me, I think is like the biggest thing for people to understand is that mindset, like don't, don't be held back by these artificial barriers that we create for ourselves. It sounds like what you're saying is as long as we're together and we're all fighting for each other, we're a union. We're a union. Yep. So on that note, I would like us all together to continue this discussion. <laughs>